thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk, um, focus in on the Portable Antiquity Scheme um, and talk about some biases which occur within the data set. Um, so I'm going to give just a bit of background, well Dot's already said, um, I was a finance liaison officer um, for Cheshire, Manchester and Merseyside for nine years um, and I've now been taken over by Ben who's doing a fantastic job um, and I've moved into a more curatorial role at the museum. So um, this talk is sort of drawing from my, rather than looking at the results of the data drawing from my experience in working with math detectorists um, and colleagues as well and where I've noticed people making decisions which um, could result in bias in the data. Um, so I thought I'd start with a brief sort of look at what is the Portable Antiquity Scheme. I'm hoping most of you are familiar with it, I know a lot of you are, um, but just because I never know who's going to be in the audience I thought I'd, I'd dip into that. Um, so every year thousands of archaeological objects are found by members of the public in England and Wales. Um, they're found by people walking, gardening and mainly by metal detectorists. So their finds can help us to build a bigger, better picture of the past. The Portable Antiquity Scheme's main aim is to advance archaeological knowledge. And that's done by recording mem um, objects found by members of the public onto the scheme database finds.org.uk which is publicly accessible. Um, so it can be used for research um, as we've just heard from our previous talk so people doing PhDs or um, any, any form of study can use them. Um, also just anybody who has an interest in finds from school children who want to look up what a emperor looks like on a coin when they're studying the Romans in school to people just having an interest in objects. Um, so currently we have over a million objects recorded on the database, so it's a huge amount of data to be used in research. Um, and sort of all of these objects can tell us about the past, so they're all going to, they don't, aren't just used one time if they're recorded by a metal detector, as one coin isn't just used for one project, it can be used over and over for multiple projects. Um, so it's a really valuable data set. Um, so when I look at a distribution map or um, statistics of some finds, I automatically sort of look for patterns in a map, as I think most archaeologists do. Um, not just patterns of where the archaeology occurs, but also patterns of where it doesn't occur and what's missing and what that can tell us. So these maps are the result of a simple search on the PAS data. Um, so just one is on spindle pearls and one on Roman <coughs> coins, excluding hoards. Um, and you can see they show sort of quite different patterns. Um, so the maps, when you do a simple search, the mapping system just shows the first 2,000 records. So it's not sort of um, conclusive data um, or comprehensive, but it does sort of show trends. Um, so I just thought I'd put this up to show sort of things that stand out in my mind when looking at maps. So we can see the spindle girls are all in double figures for the north of the country. Um, and the coins, again, the northwest looks quite barren, really. Um, so it, it's sort of bearing in mind when you're looking at our, the data why um, that is and that there are other conclusions we're not necessarily thinking of when we just sort of have a quick look that we need to dig a bit deeper, um, which I'll look into in a second. So the majority of finds, I think this was your slide, oh no, not quite, but a similar one, um, with the majority of the finds being shown as from metal detectors, but we do get other objects. Um, so the archaeological finds shouldn't technically be there because it's chance finds found by members of the public, um, but occasionally societies will um, ask for assistance, so that's probably where they're from. Um, so if I focus on the objects <laughs> recorded by metal detectors in the first instance, um, this is where some bias initially creeps into the data. So where do people choose to metal detect and why are they making these choices? A lot of the time people will go where they can get access and we know that metal detecting is illegal without landowners' permission. So there could be a huge area of land where permission is refused um, for a variety of reasons. So a blank spot on a map could just be a grumpy farmer or a protective farmer or that sort of thing. Also, finders will often go close to main roads, 
So I know a lot of the finders from Manchester because it's a very built up area. They'll go and detect in Lincolnshire or North Yorkshire, but they won't go far off the main sort of um, motorway <coughs> routes um, because they've already been driving for quite a while. So is there parking is another factor? Are they driving up a muddy track that only one car can fit up and not turn? Or if there's a rally or a club dig, which is um, where lots of metal detectors go detecting together, um, is there room for multiple cars to park? So all of these sort of decisions um, are already affecting the results of the data, as it were. On top of that, the finders will use sort of more methodical methods. So um, some of them will do historical mapping or place name research to um, look to where they will get the best results. Many of them are interested in their local history as well. So although some do travel and go to the bigger rallies, um, a lot are keen to find out what's happened in their local area um, and that sort of historical side of it. So once an object or a number of objects have been discovered and a finder chooses to record with their finds liaison officer, um, other biases may occur. So the finder will choose what they think is important to show the finds liaison officer, maybe something that they think the finds liaison officer will be impressed with. Um, or they'll choose something they're struggling to identify. So a lot of metal detectors have been detecting for 40 years or so, um, and you know are specialists in their field. Um, so sometimes we're, or the PAS is viewed as an identification service rather than recording for um, the data and the research and what that can tell us. So if they know what an object is, they might think, well, there's no point in telling the FLO. So um, these are sort of the decisions that come into it. Um, and of course, the PAS only record fines that have been found with and have with references recorded with them. So obviously there's no point in us recording the information if researchers aren't going to use that information in their research. Um, and so that grid reference is, is an important bit of contextual information. Um, so already several choices have been made before the find reaches the FLO, um, which we, the finds liaison officers can't really influence. Um, they can't sort of shape them. So these decisions feed into our archaeological data set, into the knowledge, and therefore on into museum collections also. So finds liaison officers often say to the finders they want to see everything. Um, show us everything you've recorded, or that you've discovered, sorry. Um, but more often or not, the finder will bring a selection. And to be honest, due to um, the sort of dispersal of finds liaison and officers, if we were showed everything, I think many of us, or many of them, should I say, will be cowering under the desk because there'd be too much. Um, so we could do with, um, yeah, a bit more bit more resources that way. Um, but at a detecting club, a finder will usually bring what they happen to have in their pocket. Um, so often um, the message doesn't get filtered through that the finds liaison officer is coming and people will just go, oh, I forgot you were coming, I've, I've brought this. Whereas when finders come into a museum to a fine surgery at one of the various museums that the finds liaison officers do, um, they're more likely to come prepared with a list of grid references and a lot more um, finds in a wider variety. So a typical batch of finds will include some objects in good condition, which the finders will think the FLOs want to see and record, which is true, and objects they might be struggling to identify. Um, so we've got what are known in the detecting world as a load of rots at the top of the picture, um, which are Many people will think they're too grotty to record, but obviously finds liaison officers will be used to seeing coins in those conditions and can identify them quite well, um, so they are still worth recording. Um, also, these two brooches are the same type, a Roman oval brooch, but a find is more likely to record this one than this one. They'll just think, oh, well, um, they don't want to bother with that one. Um, so if the finds liaison officer as well has a particular research um, interest or specialism, um, such as um, Bronze Age Axis, for example, um, and has given, <laughs> has given a number of talks to metal detecting clubs, they'll, you know, when they find those objects, they'll go, oh, my FLO has a real interest in these, and they'll be likely to show them a lot more. Um, so that's a, a sort of another factor um, that comes into it. 
So in Merseyside, we don't record many objects um, due to the land being mainly built up. Um, but also on the Wirral, a lot of the land is council owned and they just don't encourage metal detecting. And then we've got the Sefton Coast, which is National Trust land. So there's restrictions as well there. Um, so again, when we're looking back at those distribution maps, you might sort of think, oh, well, why is there a big blank area? Um, you know, were the Romans not here? Was there no archaeology happening? But it's just that um, we can't access that data um, through metal detecting and recording of those finds. Um, so basically, so one run-of-the-mill buckle or button, a fairly common find from Merseyside, it's going to be worth a lot more um, in terms of data than a Roman coin from Lincoln. Oh gosh, I mean it's already, sorry. It's all right. Um, so I'll speed through that one. So that was just pointing out the um, areas of restrictions. Um, looking at maps um, and just take into consideration when you look at the maps um, what areas are restricted um, and why there are blank spots. Um, so you can see from this map in 2003 to 2008 there's uh, red dots from 2003, black dots are pre-2003 and again that's just showing the difference um, from when we became a national scheme. So a lot of the issue also is Metal detectors don't have easy access to some fines liaison officers. Um, and then there's areas again that are built up. So you can see if you look at the Isle of Wight down here, um, just how much potential the scheme has when people can have easy access to their fines liaison officers. Um, and again, this was just demonstrating the spread of fines liaison officers. So whereas in this area we have one fines liaison officer for Cheshire, Manchester, and Merseyside, for the smaller counties, which might have more fines, um, the metal detectors have further to go to reach their fines liaison officer. Um, and you'll have to excuse my big yellow X there for the North Welsh <laughs> fines liaison officer who is new in both, well, not new yet, but new to this map. Um, so again, there's a fines liaison officer selection. So fines liaison officers are rather busy. It's very easy for a big backlog to build up. Um, in the areas just due to the sort of amount of coverage that we have to provide. Um, so if you have a sort of lead weight versus a Bronze Age axe, you're probably going to record the Bronze Age axe over the lead weight. Um, but what's to say that in a few years time, there's not gonna be a massive research project on lead weights. Um, so we're sort of making those decisions as to what will be researched in the future as well. One solution is to limit the number of fines per finders, um, say 10 fines per finder per visit, so that we can, it can be kept on top of. Um, and another is to sort of prioritise your local area, so in our area to pr prioritise what's been found locally as opposed to what's been found on a detecting rally in Yorkshire. Um, so one of the fines most common in the northwest is spindle whirls. Um, and when I was saying about... Um, finders knowing what your their FLO has an interest in. I was always quite keen on spindle whirls. Um, I just find them really interesting and pretty as well, um, but also they're very easy and quick to record, so um, <laughs> that's just me cheating. So the finders did show me lots and lots of spindle whirls, and Cheshire is one of the areas which has the most spindle whirls in the whole country. And I thought, well, maybe this is just because of me. Are they just showing me more? Um, but actually, when I went to speak to the county archaeologist who does a lot of metal detecting surveys prior to development, he also said that the majority of his site spindle whirls will come up consistently, um, which was a bit of a relief. Um, so just briefly looking at object types, again, the majority of objects are coins on the database, um, whereas objects which are um, not metal or more modern objects. So we've got um, some trench art, a ring made out of a coin um, from the Second World War, an early medieval sculpture, and um, a lovely flint dagger. And um, so those objects are not objects which metal detecting will pick up. So again, there's that difference that the coins will be sort of, and metalwork will obviously be just more plentiful than other objects. Um, so to sum up, um, many biases are present within the data just because of human nature and the decisions we make from the detectors all the way through to the fine liaison and officers and because decisions have to be made um, because we just can't do it all. Um, 
But that's why it's so important that the scheme keeps going and that metal detectors keep recording um, because the bigger the data, basically, it sort of evens out all that bias um, and bias that I might have for preferring spindle whirls will be balanced out by somebody from Cumbria who prefers axes. Um, and it'll all be, you know, balanced out. So the more and more we can record and capture that data for the future, um, the better. So there's currently 667 research projects ongoing on the PAS, um, and all that feeds into the archaeological record. Um, and because I think I'm out of time, if you want to read more about biases within the scheme, um, Katie Robbins has done a fantastic PhD looking at ironing out biases within the scheme um, and using the data set as a functioning tool rather than a bias collection. Um, and Tom Brindle has also done some work in his PhD on Roman fines on bias, um, so they're both worth having a look at. Thank you. Thank you.